we're going to be just doing a whole sermon on one word, and you'll hear what that word is in just a minute. So Romans chapter 8 is where I'll invite you to go, and we'll read the text in just a second. But I want to begin by getting us thinking in the right direction. And one thing I've noticed in counseling weary souls over the years, people who are hurting, is that they often question the idea that God has ever thought about them. I mean personally, truly, by name. God surely is too busy, and I am far too unimportant. Sometimes it's the comparison game. Of course, God thought about Abraham the patriarch. There is no doubt about that. And of course, Isaiah the prophet was on God's mind when he penned those beautiful songs and prophecies in that wonderful book of Scripture, and maybe even some of the squirrely characters in the Bible, like Samson, God would have thought of them. And surely in the New Testament, God cared about the apostles and Paul. But uh, does God really have time? Or am I worthy of the thoughts of God? That is kind of a question a lot of people wrestle with. I mean, maybe God thought of the heroes in the church like Athanasius or Martin Luther in this Reformation month. But me? God, think about me. And then we start thinking about the raw wounds of life, trauma, pain that we've went through. Some of us project our own pain into our relationships with God. Let's just be honest. The way we see God has a lot to do with how we maybe think about our earthly parents or people in authority or relationships that have gone wrong. So all of a sudden you start thinking about how your parents neglected you. Maybe one of them was absent. Or about how it seemed they loved their work more than you or their addiction more than you. And because of that, you feel that surely God would not really care personally about me, about my life. And then if that's not enough, you look at the vastness of the universe. Wow, this is a grand world. It's amazing, this world we live in. And you feel small and insignificant, and doubts creep in, and God feels distant to you, so you know he must also, you must also be distant to him, overlooked by his gaze. And then there's some Christians, I've realized, who think that maybe God has thought about him, but it was just 2,000 years ago at the cross. Maybe their name, your name, was on Jesus's mind at some blink of a second at the cross, but probably more likely Jesus was just thinking about your sins in some sort of an abstract, general way. But to summarize all of this, you are thinking there's no way God is thinking about me because I feel like almost no one else thinks about me. Someone in here surely has wrestled with this. And then you start looking at Scripture, and you see things like Jesus saying that the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Some of us, it's not as hard as the rest, but the point is, he knows these kind of intricate details about you, about you. And even if your earthly parents failed you and friends abandoned you and you have suffered real trauma and you do feel very small and you are doubting everything this morning. Hear the words of the psalmist where he says, Yahweh, our God, you have searched me and known me, and your thoughts are so precious to me. They're so vast how God thinks about us. He said that they outnumber the sand on the seashore, which is crazy because I looked at just a little tiny beach yesterday, like I'm talking a 10-foot long beach, and I said there's no way I could ever sit here and count 10 feet of sand much less the sand of the world, God's thoughts about me. And what's even bigger than this is in the series on the sovereignty of God, as we come to Romans 8, God didn't just start thinking about you today or the day you were saved or 2,000 years ago at the cross. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, we are going to see God sovereignly knew you from before this world ever began. And it will blow your mind if you come to these texts with a humble heart. 
and a heart of worship. So hear with me the word of the Lord, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 30. Paul says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. That was last week. For those who are called according to his purpose. And then our text today is really just one word, maybe this little phrase here, because those whom he foreknew, because those whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to become conformed to the image of his son, that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestinated, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of the Lord. Foreknowledge, predestination. Sadly, some of the most controversial words out there in the church today. As a young man, a new Christian... I remember going to the adult Sunday school class because I wanted to learn the Bible. Just a young teenager. And I sat in the class and the church had just went through an actual split, a fight over these words. And I didn't know. And I went up and I asked the teacher this question. He was a seasoned saint. I said, what are we supposed to believe about election, foreknowledge, And he was like, ah, that's really not in the Bible. It's in there once or twice. You don't need to worry about that. It's really not important. Which when you tell a teenager something's not there, guess what they're going to go do? They're going to pull out a concordance and look. And after finding 33 instances of it as a teenager, I knew something was wrong. Something was wrong. And then uh, just to give you an example, not long ago, I was on an ordination exam of ministers to the gospel ministry in which... Someone on this committee that was not a fan of the word foreknowledge and predestination asked two young men this question. You're not those kind of people who believe in that foreknowledge election funny business. I'm trying to make light of it because he was pretty serious. And they said, oh no, we would never believe in that stuff, which I couldn't keep quiet anymore. And I said, I need to interrupt for a minute. I said, you just said earlier in this examination that you believe the Bible is the Word of God. Yeah, we do believe the Bible is the Word of God. Good, 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 good. You believe every word of the Bible is the inspired, infallible, perfect Word of God. Yes, yes we do. Then you can't say you don't believe in election and foreknowledge. We can have a conversation about what you believe about it. That's totally cool. You can't say you don't believe in it because it's in the Word of God. You can't do that. So why are we discussing this this morning? You can't avoid it. That's why. All Scripture is God's Word, and so we talk about these terms because the Bible talks about these terms. Believing in Jesus as he is proclaimed in the gospel is what saves, but how does the gospel save? That's what we're going to see this morning, the beginning of the sequence of salvation. And just to set the record straight, John Calvin, Martin Luther, St. Augustine, none of these guys invented the doctrine of foreknowledge or election. In fact, if you get Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, this is nerd talk, but I'll just give it to you anyhow, and you read, you won't even find him talking about election till 900 pages in, all right? This is, you know, there is a conception out there, and I just want to say this on the, out, on the onset. There are some people that have been called Calvinists, right? Right? And there has been some confusion. Now, we're a Reformed church, and we identify with some of these things that are commonly called Calvinism, of course, as if we're following John Calvin. That's crazy talk. I want to make that clear, which is why we use the term Reformed. It's a far more helpful term. But there are some people out there that have earned the title Cage Stage Calvinist, okay? You're saying, what does that mean? These are people, all they talk about 
is foreknowledge and election to the point ad nauseum, they need to be locked in a cage until they calm down. That's what I mean by it. There may be someone like that here. It's okay. We still love you. But I got a cage in the back if you want to go. All right? We need to emphasize what the Bible emphasizes. And sometimes we get a bad rap because of misrepresentations of who God is. So I want to say all that on the onset. There are a lot of misrepresentations where God is some diabolical deity, a tyrant playing some sort of capricious games with our lives. He's a puppet master with a bunch of strings, and that's kind of God. And I want you to hear today, that's the very opposite of what we're going to see. This is a doctrine about the eternal love of God. This is a doctrine that says God thinks about you. He knows you, and he will be most glorified in how he thinks about you and what he is doing for his people. As wonderful as Romans 8, 28 is, and it is wonderful that God works all things for good. That was last week. We have to consider now how God works all things for good in more detail. You see, last week we saw God's sovereignty in all things, how he works, but now we need to think about why. What is the weight behind 828? Now, the verses we're going to look at today, 29 and 30, and we're really just looking at one word in verse 29, they are short, but every word is pregnant with theological weight. And it's life-changing. You want to check out, don't check out. You need this in your Christian faith. It will change your outlook on the world and life. Theologians have called this God's golden chain of salvation. So I made the five words there gold for you. So you will remember this has been called God's golden chain of salvation. Romans 8.28 gives us the perspective from our view. We're seeing God doing all these great things, right? But now verses 29 and 30 are going to be from God's view. And by the way, you don't have God's view. He's just giving us a glimpse of it here to understand him better and know he hasn't failed you and know he's working in the world. Five acts, five links in this chain that he works on behalf of those he's thinking about. So when you read this here, this chain is going to stretch back from eternity past. And each one of these links over the next few weeks are going to take us to the future, to eternity future. And we are going to see God sovereign from foreknowledge in the past to glorified in the future. So God is the author of our salvation from beginning to end. These are unbreakable links. That's why they're golden. Five verbs, five links. God forged every one of these. God is the architect of every one of these. These are put together by God. Nothing will be added to them. Nothing will be subtracted from them. There are no dropouts. God is the subject of each link. It is God who foreknows. It is God who predestines. It is God who calls. It is God who justifies. It is God who glorifies. In theology, we say God is monergistic, mono meaning alone. He is the worker in these verses. God is, it is all rooted and grounded. Why we know all things work together for good is because everything is rooted and grounded in God himself. From him, through him, and to him are all things. God is not in heaven biting his metaphorical fingernails, wondering if it's all going to work out. He is sovereign in all, including in eternity past. So how does this text begin? For is the first word. For tells us verse 29 is explaining verse 28. How can we be sure all things work together for good? Why do we love God? What does it mean to be called by God? What is the purpose of God in this world? Well, Paul says, I'm glad you asked that question. Let me tell you. You can't think of your future without thinking about your past, Christian. Because it is the past that grounds the present and the future. 
For, he says, those whom he foreknow. Stop right there. Foreknew. One word, foreknew. All right, let's talk a little bit about what some people think about this passage before we kind of get to what it's talking about, all right? There's a few different views on this in the Christian church. And guess what? I think they're all Christians who hold these views. I just happen to think there's one right view and there's a lot of wrong views, okay? So I want you to think about it with me today. What does it mean that God foreknew? What does it mean about his thoughts are on me? Some people read it this way. God knew intellectually. You've probably heard a preacher say, if you've been in the church long, if you're new to the church, this is your first time, uh, saddle up. This is, we're going to ride today, all right? But God looked down the corridors of time, and he saw different people making responses to the gospel. He was watching men, watching women, watching children, and he knew our free choices, and God predestinated us based on what he saw our choices to be. So on the basis of what God learned when he was looking down the corridors of time before the world began, when God learned if you would say yes or no, that is when God foreknew you and predestinated you. Now I want to say on the onset, no one disputes the fact that God knows everything in advance. That's called the omniscience of God. God would not be God if he didn't know all things. God couldn't choose people if he didn't know those people. There's no doubt. He's aware of everything. We only have knowledge of the past. God foresees the future just like he sees the past. It's a little different when it comes to God. So what is going on here exactly? Well, first off, I want to say I think this view is wrong because this says God foreknew a certain people. Notice, people he foreknew, he predestinated, he called, he justified, he glorified. If this word foreknew just simply means he knows all things about you, well, guess what? Then he foreknows everybody. Because everybody surely is exposed before the vision of God as omniscient God. This would not be anything special at all. And if that were the case, that would mean everybody not only is foreknown, everyone is predestinated, everyone is made right with God and saved, and everyone is glorified. You would have to be a universalist. What do I mean by that? You'd have to say everyone's going to heaven. It doesn't matter what we do. It's all good. Who's really the puppet master at that point, right? Just do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. The whole point of this text is God's grace. By the way, this text never says, nor do any of the texts say, God foreknows what you're going to do. I just want to point that out. And we're going to see that in a minute. Everywhere in the Bible, it says God foreknows people, not God foreknows actions. The idea that God looked into the future and learned something, I hate to tell you this, this is a pagan idea. This is a pagan concept. This is a God who evolves a God who's learning, a God who's small, a God who's being schooled, a God who's not omniscient. Last week, we saw the sovereignty of God in all things. That can't match up with what we've studied so far. Others say that this is some sort of a corporate election. The idea is, well, God elected Israel, the Jewish people in the Old Testament. God elects the church, all the people that kind of gather in the doors today, not individuals. It is not individuals who God knows. God doesn't think about you personally. He just thinks about institutions, bodies, that kind of a thing. And while that sounds warm, I think that's exactly the opposite of everything Paul is saying in Romans 9 to 11. In fact, in Romans 9, he talks about how God chose Jacob and not Esau, right? That God, out of all the pagans, God called Abraham, right? Think about Romans 11 with me. He says, has God rejected his people? He says, look, I'm an Israel knight. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Now, he's going to make it very clear in Romans 11, not all Israelites, just because you have ethnic DNA of Jewish blood, doesn't mean you're God's people, in fact, he makes it clear here that it is only a remnant right now, according to God's gracious choice, that are his people. And that's nothing new. 
That's how it was in Elijah's day too. Remember, only 7,000 were elect and foreknown by God in that time. So I don't think this has to do with some sort of a corporate election. God just elected a body. That is nowhere in the Bible. You'll never see foreknowledge having to do with God foreknowing what you're going to do, nor will you see God foreknowing a body of people in some way. Abraham was chosen, Jacob was chosen, not Esau, so on and so forth. Romans 9, written by the greatest missionary to ever walk the earth, the Apostle Paul. Note, the same is true in Romans 8, 29, by the way. Paul says that it is we Christians whom God knows, right? It is us. For those whom God works all things together for good, those who love God, those are the ones he foreknows. It has to do with a personal relationship. So let's just stop for a minute. Let's define the word. Okay, you still following with me? No one's asleep yet. Don't go to sleep. It's going to get preachy again, all right? Just keep that brain going for a minute. You got your coffee out there, all right? What does the word foreknow mean? There's different definitions that have been given, and we need to know what the Bible says, but I want to read a few first. One dictionary says to have knowledge beforehand, to foreknow. You know, it's never helpful to define a word by repeating the word. Did anyone ever teach you that? Have in mind as part of a long-standing plan, have plans for, know before. This is a deeply embedded Hebraic perception. To choose or select in advance of some other event, to choose beforehand, to know in advance. In the New Testament, it refers to God's foreknowledge as election of his people. Now, where do we first see God foreknowing, first see God choosing somebody? That may be helpful to think about. Well, of course, it is Israel. And when God chooses Israel, he chooses individuals, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's dozen, his 12 sons, right? And when he chooses them, God wants to explain to them why he chose them to be a treasured people. Why does he love them? Why does he think about them? Let's be honest. Why does he put up with them and put up with us? Why? Why? Look what it says in Deuteronomy 7. Yahweh did not set his affection on you or choose you because you were more in number than any of the other peoples. You were the fewest of all peoples. It is because Yahweh, what? What does it say? He loved you. His choice is based on his love, not something good in them, not because they were great, not because they were so spiritual. If you think God chose Abraham because he was great and spiritual, you need to go back and reread Genesis. And I promise, if you've already read it, you flunked the Genesis Bible interpretation class. Abraham was a walking nightmare who was justified by faith. If you think God chose Israel because they were so spiritual in the wilderness, you need to go back and read Exodus and Numbers. You flunked that class, brothers and sisters. They were like a typical Baptist church in 2024, grumbling, complaining sinners. Don't you think he did this because they were so it, right? They had something so great in them. Now, what does it mean to know in the Bible? I think it's important to understand that. Let's pause for a minute. What does it mean to know in the Bible? It's not just intellectual. See, we're thinking from 2024 English language, to know something is to intellectually know something about it. It's to know details, right? Cognitive. No, that's not what knowing is in Scripture. Let me show you what it means to know in Scripture. All right? Adam knew Eve, his wife. That's not just intellectual, brothers and sisters. And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. That's called personal relationship, correct? He personally knew, chose, loved Eve. Exodus 33, Yahweh said to Moses, You have found favor in my sight. That's grace. I know you by name. Deuteronomy 9. Israel, you have been rebellious against the Lord from the day I knew you. 
I knew you. This is relational, not intellectual at all. Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah the prophet, before I formed you in the womb, before you even existed, I knew you. I knew you, Jeremiah. And by the way, he knew you and you and you if you know him. Amos 3, Israel, out of all the families of the earth, I have only known you. This is personal, relational, love, mercy, grace, all those beautiful terms. That's what it means to know in the Bible. But you say, that's just the Old Testament. Paul's writing in the New Testament. Wow, you're so right. So let's look at the New Testament. Look what Jesus says in his first great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. On the day of judgment, he will say to the people, I knew you intellectually, but not spiritually, so depart from me. Is that what he says? He says to those who are lost, to those who don't believe, to those who don't follow him, I never knew you. There are some people that are not known from eternity past, is the point I'm trying to say. I never knew you. There was never a time I knew you in this special way. Luke 1, Mary speaking in this beautiful innocency to the angel. How can I bring the Messiah? How can I bear God in the world? I never knew. I don't know a man. Relation, right? Relation. How about John 10? Jesus speaking. I know my sheep, right? The sheep follow the shepherd. They know my voice. I know mine and they know me. Knowing is not cognitive and intellectual. It's relational. It's love. Listen, it is about how God personally knows you. A few more. If anyone loves God, he's known of God. And you're not known of God if you don't love him. What did Romans 8 just say? For those who love God, all things work together for good. Galatians 4. Now, having known God, or rather, I love Paul here, I love this, or rather, having been known by God, why would you turn back? 2 Timothy 2, God's firm foundation stands. What is it? The Lord knows those who are his. Foreknowledge is love, distinguishing personal electing love. That's what it is. God doesn't love or choose some future version of you. I want you to hear this right now. Please hear this. God does not love and choose some less struggling version of you in the room. God does not foreknow, love, choose some cleaner version of you. Jesus knew what he was redeeming what he was changing at the cross. And he ain't surprised by any of your past or any of your struggles today. This word means God has set his special love upon a person, his choice on them. I know I'm bombing you with scripture because it's everywhere. And you can just say, I don't want to believe it. I mean, that's fine. And we'll go about our business. Or you can worship God. I mean, that's your choice. I'm not trying to make anyone uncomfortable. This is the greatest news ever. My salvation is not what I have done. It's not in my hands. If it was, I'd botch it every time. And if I could lose my salvation, I would. (laughs) Because I'm a walking mess. And some of you are too. I hate to tell you. 1 Peter 1, verse 2. Listen how Peter, by the way, don't be ashamed of these Bible words. People are like, oh, we need to not talk about these things. They're controversial. And then Peter says, let me start my letter by saying this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are, what? Elect, exiles, in all these fun places, according to the what? the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, for the obedience to Jesus Christ 
with the sprinkling of his blood. The entire Trinity knows you, <laughs> loves you, involved in your salvation. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Peter doesn't save this to chapter 5. He comes out in chapter 1. You've got to accept this or you're going to be doubting and wrestling and battling and constantly thinking you're not good enough. And the greatest news ever is to realize you are right. You're not great enough. God is great. <laughs> he is the Savior and Lord. God determined this. He foreknew you. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20. You were not redeemed, Peter says. Please pay attention to this. With corruptible things like silver or gold from the way you used to act, but with the precious blood of Jesus, like a lamb unblemished and spotless. The blood of Christ, it's all Jesus' work. He, now this is interesting, Jesus was foreknown. Yeah, this just means intellectually, right? The Father knew that Jesus would exist. No, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Jesus is God. He didn't just intellectually know about Jesus. The Trinity is eternal. Jesus has always been God. When he's about to die on the cross, he says, Father, restore to me the glory I had with you before this world ever existed. Always he's been God. And yet he was foreknown. That means more than intellectual, loved, chosen, appointed before the foundation of the world. God does not foreknow or chose qualities or knowledge. This is personal. Election is God's sovereign working in our lives. He thinks about you. He knows you. Two reasons why everyone deep down in their heart knows this is true. Take these from J.I. Packer and one of his excellent works. Two reasons why you know this is true, even if you're fighting it right now in your heart. Number one, you thank God for saving you. You don't say, God, thank you that I had enough faith to come to you. God, thank you that I was righteous enough to believe on you. God, thank you that I am good enough to trust you, unlike all those other people who do not. Every saint from Genesis to Revelation, Jonah coming out of the great fish, salvation is of the Lord, right? Of him, through him, to him are all things. Why do you thank God for saving you? You did not save yourself. That's why. There's a second way I know this. And that is that you pray for the conversion of others. You pray like God can actually change someone else's heart. Why in the world would you pray if God was helpless in the heavens, biting his fingernails, wondering if anything's going to happen? You pray because you know what we've said so far in this series. God is God, which means he is all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful. It means his authority overrides all authorities. His will overrides all wills. God is God. And when you pray, you pray like God is God, which means you know that God is sovereign. Or you would say, Lord, you're helpless, so I don't know what to do. But we don't pray like that. Not any good Christian, right? No one prays like that. This is the theology of the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God says, you are my witnesses. I have chosen you. Why? That you may know and believe me and understand that I am me. Jesus says, you did not choose me, I chose you. Ephesians, Paul, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That we would be holy and blameless by predestinating us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. 
This is all God's working, friends. Those whom God foreknew, God predestinated, God called, God justified, God glorified. If you think God looked down the corridors of time and he saw something in you that made him choose you, you are repudiating many important things. Number one, you have rejected the doctrine of spiritual death. How did the Bible begin? God told Adam, if you eat of the tree, you will surely die. And by one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. We are dead in our sins. When we get saved, he makes us alive who are dead in our sins. And there's only one thing dead men do, and that's stink, brothers and sisters. Our works of righteousness are filthy in the sight of God. We can't move one finger to God. No man comes to me unless the Father which sent me draws him, Jesus says. Will you believe Jesus? No man comes to me unless the Father is drawing Why? He loves you. That's why. He knows you. That's why. Every intention of the heart of man is only evil continually. He didn't look down the corridors of time and said, oh, look, there's a little blip there where the heart's doing the right thing. I'm going to choose that guy. That's not grace. That's not unearned, undeserved, unmerited. It's saying Salvation is 99% God and 1% you. Or 50% God and 50% you. It's wrong. There was a very famous Hindu holy man by the name of Rao. He was a mystic and a yogi. And he claimed to have such control over his body, he could eat glass, as you see pictured there, swallow poison, eat live vipers, walk on fire, And he even made the claim he could survive an atomic bomb. He's a special fellow. In 1966, he made the headlines. He claimed he would publicly walk on water. He was going to do what Jesus did. Over 600 people paid good money to watch him walk on water. Some of the most famous people in India. The crowd gathered around a large pool in Bombay. The holy man prayerfully prepared himself for the miracle. He stepped forward to the pool's edge and there was this solemn hush. He, uh, Mr. Rao, glanced upward to heaven. One foot up, stepped forward towards the water. And he immediately plummeted into the pool's depths. Sputtering, dripping wet, furious. He came out of the pool and he turned on the crowd and he blamed them. One of you is an unbeliever. He was wrong. We're all unbelievers. We're all lost. None of us can walk on water because none of us are God. None of us can save ourselves. What good did God see in Mary Magdalene to foreknow her? Seven devils cast out of her. What good did God see in the immoral woman weeping at the feet of Jesus? What good did God see in the woman at the well having gone through five husbands and the one that was left was not her husband? What good did God see in the Corinthians? They were sexually immoral. They were idolaters. They were adulterers. They were effeminate. They were homosexuals. They were thieves. They were greedy. They were drunkards. They were revilers. They were swindlers. What good did God look down in eternity past and see in them and say, you know what? I'm going to choose those people. We have to come to terms with this today. We also are sinners, outcasts, misfits, lost, hopeless. We choose spiritual darkness. We choose the occult. We choose playing with dark things. We repeat to ourselves the same lies over and over again in our minds, and we are captive in bondage. We choose pornography on our phones. We choose laughing at evil things. We choose being two-faced. We choose cursing others. We choose gossiping. We choose addictions and drunkenness and pills and getting high. We choose pride walking around thinking we're better than everyone else. We choose selfishness. 
We choose lying, cheating, running the streets, hiding, snorting, deceiving, caught up in the world with no sensibility to God at all, dead in our sins. That's what we choose. We choose bullying, screaming anger, pride, judgmental attitudes, snobbery, selfishness. We walk around with cold hearts, with no compassion. That's what we choose on our own. I've said it to you before. I know why the Bulls chose Michael Jordan. And I know why the Dolphins chose Dan Marino and the Patriots chose Tom Brady. And I know why Alabama chose Saban and why every team would like to choose Messi. I get it, right? They have something to offer in those particular categories. But the big question, the question of eternity past, is why in the world would God choose any of us to be in his family God didn't love some future version of you. God didn't love some less struggling version of you. God didn't love some cleaner version of you. Jesus knew exactly what he was buying at the cross. He knew who he was dying for. He's not surprised by your struggles today. We were not looking for God. We were looking for sin and enjoying it. But I am so thankful God came looking for us to make me a Christian. To say, you're forgiven. To say, you're a new person. You're a saint. You're not a sinner. You are a saint. To say, you might be poor in this world, but you got an eternal heavenly inheritance. You got more. Look, in heaven, the streets are made of gold. Pavement is gold. That's how good God is. You are a child of the king. You have a direct line to the throne of the universe when you pray. And brothers and sisters, most of all, you are loved. People might hate you and reject you, but not God. You are loved. Do you believe that? You are not worthy. That's what makes it beautiful. Man, why we fight about this stuff? Receive the love of God. The old evangelist used to say, the elect are the whosoever wills, and the non-elect are the whosoever wants. The truth is, we're all whosoever wants. It is only because God foreknew us that we become whosoever wills. Very famous Bible teacher, Donald Gray Barnhouse, pastor at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, used to tell this story to help people understand this big word for knowledge. And by the way, I want to tell you something. I know about this word. I still don't understand it. I just worship God because of it. Can I just be honest? Studying the Bible a long time. I just worship God. I don't have to understand it. He's good. That's what I know. But Barnhouse said this. Imagine a cross like the one on which Jesus died. So large this cross was that it has a door in the front of it. And over the door are the words from Revelation, whoever will may come. And these words represent the offer, the the general call of the gospel, the offer to everyone, whoever will may come. And by God's grace, that message of salvation is to proclaim to every soul in this room and every soul in the world. Every man, every woman, every one of you children in here, hear me. Whoever will may come to Jesus, you're invited. But when you die and you walk in through that cross, you're going to turn around and a happy surprise awaits you. Because from the inside, from God's point of view, you turn around and you see foreknown and predestinated, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Election is best understood in hindsight. It's not what we understand before we saved. It's what we understand after we're saved. We decide to follow Christ because God decided for us because he loves us. It is 100% God, friends. God chose me long before I chose him. God loved me long before I loved him. God pursued me long before I pursued him. God knew me long before I knew him. You can fight it. Or you can love him back and rest in it. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer.